This is a cautionary tale for every country and every generation. The story of what happened when a civilized and cultured people surrendered its will to a charismatic political leader. The story began a hundred years ago, here in the Austrian town of Braunau, with a child born in this house, Adolf Hitler. Für Sie genügt nicht die bloße Ablegung des Bekenntnisses. Ich glaube, sondern das Schwur, ich treffe. When I came face to face with Hitler, I felt I had come face to face with God. He wanted to create a better world. And when he died, I had the feeling I had lost my father. In the death camps of the Second World War, Hitler's Germany came closer than human beings have ever come to creating hell on earth. The terrible truth, which most people still find too terrible to accept, is that despite his crimes against humanity, Hitler was a political genius, a man with a fatal attraction for the German people. At his peak, the most popular leader in Europe. The child born here in Braunau belonged to that handful of human beings who have clearly and decisively changed the history of the 20th century. Linz, Austria, the site of the only memorial to the Hitler family, the grave of Hitler's parents. Nothing about his parents or Adolf's early life gave any hint of the extraordinary career that was to come. His father, Alois, was a stern, short-tempered customs official who beat his son. His mother, Clara, tried to protect him. When she died, young Adolf was broken by grief. He kept her portrait with him for the rest of his life. The infant Adolf was baptized and brought up as a Catholic. At the age of six, he entered the monastery school at Lambach. Soon, he was top of his class. Hitler was a chorister at the great Abbey Church of Lambach. I used, he said, to intoxicate myself with the solemn splendor of the services. Every day when he sang in the choir, he saw the memorial to an earlier abbot. Above it was an emblem which a quarter of a century later, Hitler was to adopt for the Nazi party, the swastika. In his teens, Hitler became a moody adolescent. At secondary school in Linz, he lost interest in most of his work. His ambition was to go to Vienna and become an artist or architect. Once there, he produced architectural drawings and watercolors like these, competent, but not good enough to win the place he longed for at the Viennese Academy of Fine Arts. Little by little, all Hitler's early ambitions in Vienna turned sour. After the shock of being turned down twice by the Academy of Fine Arts, he became a drifter. Hitler later called his period in Vienna the most miserable time of my life. Three of those miserable years were spent here in a Viennese backstreet at this hostel for homeless men. In this depressing hostel, the future Führer passed much of the day sitting with other inmates churning out drawings and watercolors which earned him a modest income. When he drifted from Vienna to Germany in 1913, he was still dreaming of becoming a great artist or famous architect. Munich, the 1st of August, 1914. A cheering crowd welcomes the outbreak of the First World War. On the right is a photographer, and among the crowd he's photographing is the 25-year-old Adolf Hitler. 
Now, for the first time, film has been discovered of Hitler at this turning point in his life as he waits to enlist as a soldier. For me, as for every German, said Hitler, there now began the greatest, most unforgettable time in my earthly existence. He discovered in war a sense of purpose he had failed to find in peace. The years of drifting were at an end. When his unit arrived here in the fields of Flanders, he had no doubt that Germany would win a great victory and that his destiny was to take part in it. Then came the misery of trench warfare. Here in this group of dugouts and trenches near the town of Ypres, Hitler spent days on end, knee-deep in the mud, while enemy artillery pounded the German line. Hitler served as battalion messenger, which was anything but a soft option. Part of his two-mile run to battalion headquarters ran the gauntlet of enemy machine guns. From one of these covered trenches, Hitler wrote to a friend, I've been risking my life every day, looking death straight in the eye. His commanders tended to agree. Hitler's bravery won him the Iron Cross twice. On one occasion, he captured four French soldiers single-handed. The day he received his first Iron Cross was, he said, the happiest day of my life. Fighting opposite Hitler during the last German offensive in 1918 was the future British Prime Minister, Anthony Eden. Later, in the 1930s, the two men reminisced together. I had marked to Hitler that this was the, nearly the anniversary of the 21st of March, 1918, when the Germans broke shoulder of his army and very nearly got to the Channel ports. And he said, were you in that battle? So I said, yes. And he said, so was I. And became very eager and talked all about it. And we discovered that we were virtually opposite each other. And on the back of the menu card, we drew our lines. He drew his side of the line, I drew mine, with his signature at the bottom, on the other side. And let me tell you, the corporal knew a great deal about that line and, and, and where everybody was, much more than I think an average corporal would be expected to know. Until almost the last moment of the war, Hitler kept his faith in a glorious German victory. But in the autumn of 1918, his world collapsed around him. A gas attack left him blind for several weeks. Then came the even greater shock of the German surrender. Defeat was followed by a humiliating peace at Versailles. The injustice of Versailles rankled with most Germans for the next 20 years. Unable to accept that the German army had lost the war, Hitler convinced himself that the soldiers had been stabbed in the back by communist revolutionaries and parliamentary politicians. This is a contemporary poster. The stab in the back, he believed, was part of a great Jewish conspiracy. The Jews, the oldest scapegoats in European history, became in Hitler's embittered imagination the scapegoats for Germany's humiliation. The filthy Jewish rabble, he declared, drove our people into the dreadful calamity of 1918. Hitler's obsession with that calamity propelled him into politics. Well, I think there are many situations in human history where um, people are in trouble and despair following a defeat, following uh, evil, and somehow or other it lacks somebody to pull it together. And that was the case in 1918 in Germany. But I think that um, Hitler, one could perfectly well see, might well have gone to his death uh, as just a crank, who nobody took seriously, who was a bore in a bar. Uh, but the situation was there, and for once the situation didn't produce, but found a man who could take him out of it. Suddenly, Hitler discovered the greatest talent he possessed, the gift of public speaking. That extraordinary gift later became the key to his fatal attraction for the German people. Already, Hitler was obsessed by the racist vision of a new Germany, freed from the Jewish yoke, rescued from defeat, dominating Europe. He joined a small group of fanatical nationalists in Munich. 
they became the National Socialist German Workers' Party, or Nazis. In 1921, Hitler became their leader. The first film of the apprentice Führer campaigning shows him as still a rather awkward figure, not yet certain of his role as Germany's messiah. In 1923, Hitler felt strong enough to try and seize power in Munich. Emil Klein, the only stormtrooper still alive who marched with Hitler, now retraces their steps. Everything went well until the marchers found armed police blocking their exit from a narrow street. We were still singing as we marched down the street. And suddenly, we heard shots being fired ahead of us. The procession stopped. We were speechless and couldn't explain what had happened. Until word came from the front of the march saying that Hitler was dead. I saw men. I saw men with tears in their eyes. And I myself was very moved too, and had great difficulty keeping myself under control. Though Hitler in fact survived the hail of bullets, he was arrested and locked in a cell at Landsberg prison. At first he was so depressed he refused to eat. Then his confidence returned as he discovered that the failed uprising had made him a local hero. At the trial, Hitler rounded on his accusers. He told the judges who gave him a prison sentence, history will tear to tatters the verdict of this court. After the propaganda triumph at his trial, Hitler set out to write the Bible of National Socialism. He dictated much of the text here in his cell to his faithful follower, Rudolf Hess. The other prisoners sat around as Hitler read out the completed chapters to them. The book as a whole dwells on the great obsessions which had come to dominate Hitler's political thought, the Jews racism, living space for the German people in the East, the evils of Marxism and parliamentary democracy. But it also includes Hitler's views on a bizarre variety of other topics, ranging from boxing to syphilis. Hitler was a brilliant orator, but an indifferent writer. The amazing appeal Hitler was later to exercise was based not on the turgid prose of Mein Kampf, but on his mastery of the spoken word. After leaving prison, the leader, or Führer as he now called himself, had a new political strategy. Instead of planning another coup, he aimed to win power through an election victory. Hitler's obsession with the Jews and living space in Eastern Europe could never have given him mass support. What was to win him millions of votes was instead his vision of a great national revival. Hitler's election opportunity came with the onset of the Depression. In a few years, one in three of the labor force was out of work. The Nazis claimed to have the answer. Ilse Wendel was a church social worker during the Depression among the unemployed in the Berlin slums. By 1932, German industrial production had fallen by almost half among the unemployed in these slums, she found a pervading sense of hopelessness about the future. It's the poverty which still strikes you here, very much indeed. You can see how destructed the walls are, you can see it's there. The houses were so near to each other that the women talked to each other from the windows. What I do miss our children, when I came here, there were many children playing around, dozens of them. The despair was so terrible as I can't describe it. You had everywhere 
beggars. Wherever you went in Berlin, you had beggars. The people came onto the courtyards and were singing and singing just for, for a penny. The democratic political parties offered no solution. To millions of Germans, the only hope was Adolf Hitler. I supported Hitler because he, after having seen all that depravity, all that poverty here, was the only one who could do social justice to the people here. They were in a terrible misery. Using the slogan, the Fuhrer over Germany, Hitler became the first politician to use the aeroplane to campaign in several different cities on the same day. His message was simple. Only he could save Germany. By 1932, at the depth of the Depression, the Nazis, with over a third of the vote, were easily the largest political party, and easily their greatest asset was Hitler's oratory. He had that ability which is needed to make people stop thinking critically and just emote the ability derived from his readiness to throw himself totally open to to appear as it were bare and naked before his audience to to tear open his heart and display it <laughs> Before the audience hear his messianic vision of a great national revival, Hitler builds up the suspense by keeping them waiting, often for an hour or more. At the speaker's platform, Hitler adds to the tension by keeping his audience waiting again. He does what no politician nowadays would dare to do. For a full minute, he stays silent. When he feels he's gauged the mood of the audience, he starts, but slowly and quietly. He had an actor's ability to throw on a few extra generators and suddenly become absolutely charged with energy. It wasn't as though he was using words, it's as though the emotions came direct without words almost. There was a rawness about it to power. In nun selbst allein liegt die Zukunft des deutschen Volkes. Wenn wir selbst dieses deutsche Volk emporführen durch eigene Arbeit, durch eigenen Fleiß, eigene Entschlossenheit, eigenen Trotz, eigene Beharrlichkeit, dann werden wir wieder emporsteigen, genau wie die Väter einst auch Deutschland. 
man nicht das Schild dahinten, sondern selbst den schaffen mussten. Nobody has ever had this power to move audiences. He had. And this is not just um, the man in the street, this is many German intellectuals who are moved by this appeal and stirred by this extraordinary self-confidence in this man. And what he says is the way he says it. You come back to that. And that's a very disconcerting thing for people. So they want somehow or another to explain it away. But it's there. In January 1933, Hitler comes to power, not as he had hoped through outright victory at the polls, but as head of a coalition government. As this withering glance suggests, Hitler despises his coalition partners. He quickly outmaneuvers them and establishes his own dictatorship. A month after he comes to power, the Reichstag building, the parliament building in Berlin is set on fire. This happens to come at the time when he is constantly insisting that there is a communist plot to overthrow the new government and to carry out a revolution. And the Reichstag fire goes up in flames, which everybody could see. Before that night was over, he had got a set of decrees drawn up which transformed the situation politically. All the guarantees in which people in any democratic state, the freedom of speech and so on, freedom from arrest, all this is swept away. In Berlin, wie in anderen Universitätsstädten Deutschlands, wurden undeutsche und unsittliche Bücher von den Studenten eingesammelt und öffentlich verbrannt. A majority of Germans tolerate the burning of books, the banning of other political parties, and the setting up of a police state, because Hitler offers a way out of the depression. If he's doing things which are not so good, which happened, then we said, well, you have to take the rough with the smooth. Dictatorship seemed to be, not that I wanted it, but it seemed to be the only way to get out of the mess. Uh, so I thought that was a good thing that they cut away all this nonsense and rather did something, really did something, and that's what Hitler did. He really went to town with Germany. Of course, he had the mise en scène, the enormous masses of troops, the the flags, the, the music, the, the grandeur of it all, which made Cecil B. DeMille look rather paltry. Hitler had a serious message which concerned every German anyhow, the humiliation of Versailles, the economic difficulties, but above all, the injury to their national pride and he eliminated, at the cost of planning a war, he eliminated the crushing unemployment that Germany suffered. And he gave millions of people new confidence and indeed uh, welfare. They were doing better, much better. Feverish Nazi propaganda depicted Germany's economic recovery as simply a matter of the Fuhrer pressing the right buttons. He spends his way out of the depression by public works and secret rearmament. The image left by the newsreels is of Hitler with varying degrees of aplomb, opening one new motorway after another. Some of the recovery was due to the policies of previous governments, but Hitler took the credit for it all.
From the beginning to the end of Hitler's Germany, those who were most vulnerable to his appeal were the young. They came in their tens of thousands, full of youthful idealism to worship the Fuhrer in the awesome surroundings of the Nuremberg Stadium. Among the worshippers in the Hitler Youth was Alphonse Heck, now a writer on the Nazi period. The decisive turning point in my life occurred at the age of 10. From that moment on, I would remain beholden to Adolf Hitler long until after our defeat. I was one of 82,000 members of the Hitler Youth lined up in the Zeppelin's field. I stood in the first row. And when Hitler began to speak, we were just tingling with nervousness, finally to see our God. When he appeared on the podium, I was afraid to look at my neighbor because I didn't want him to see the tears in my eyes. My knees were shaking. And Hitler beamed down on us. He calmed us down by lifting his hands, both hands, several times. When he began to speak, it was in a very conversational tone. Man to boy, father to son. Und ich weiß, das kann nicht anders sein, denn ihr seid Fleisch von unserem Fleisch und Blut, von unserem Blut. Und in euren jungen Gehirn brennt dasselbe Geist, der uns beherrscht. And he said how fortunate we were to live in this new age. And he said from now on you no longer have to fear any class distinction. You're all one belonging to me. But the essence and the emphasis occurred in the final sentences. He leaned over the podium, and I know he looked straight into my eyes, and he said, you, my boys, the young of Germany, live in a fortunate time because you are the standard bearers of the movement. You will inherit what we have so far created. One day you are going to rule the world. And from that moment on, without any doubt, I was bound to Adolf Hitler long until after our defeat. At the heart of the fatal attraction was a fatal deception. Hitler promised his adult followers that the new Germany would, in his words, secure peace in the world. All the time, he planned a war in Eastern Europe to conquer a great empire for the master race. Most Germans were opposed to war. But when war came, it was too late to break the spell cast by Hitler's messianic leadership. The mid-1930s were the halcyon years of Hitler's Germany. Germany was at peace, her prosperity restored, her national pride recovered. To those prepared to ignore or justify the police state, it seemed a beautiful Germany. A host of distinguished foreign visitors, many with impeccable democratic credentials, came to call on the Führer at his mountain retreat, the Berghof. Among them was the former British Prime Minister, David Lloyd George. With LG was his secretary, Albert Sylvester. Hitler ran down the flight of stairs to welcome LG as he got out of his car, shook hands with him most warmly, and conducted us into the inside of the Berghof. I asked uh, Ribbentrop whether the Hitler would permit me to take photographs, and he asked, he asked the Führer, and, and Hitler nodded to me that I could. Mr. Sylvester's home movie, taken inside the Berghof, shows Britain's leader in the First World War being given a guided tour by Germany's Führer in the Second. He took us round and round this massive room, the only light of which came 
from a massive window, which was terrific. I'd never seen such a window. Then we were taken by him to tea. Tea was already laid on, on low tables, round which we, we all sat. There were 13 of us, and uh, we were served by special officers, obviously belonging to Hitler's guard. The, the highlight of the tea party was when Hitler uh, uh, suddenly produced a, a photograph of himself, which he had signed, and he presented it to Lloyd George. It was in a beautiful frame. Lloyd George was very touched indeed. He rose from his seat, he grasped uh, 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 Hitler by the hand and thanked him profusely. Lloyd George said, you have done great things for Germany. You have restored her honor and you have gained for her equal rights in the world. These overgrown ruins are all that now remain of the Berghof. It was here, far from the millions of his followers, that Hitler felt most able to relax. The inner circle at the Berghof saw a quite different man from the charismatic Führer of the party rallies. For Hitler's cronies, like Foreign Minister von Ribbentrop, seen here in the Berghof home movies, life at Hitler's retreat was both reassuring and agreeable. And there was an entertaining side to the off-duty Führer, as Ribbentrop's private secretary discovered. I was overwhelmed by the possibility to meet the Führer personally. And uh, for instance, uh, for, the, for the beginning, he was a sort of a messiah for me. He was a man who liked a joke. He could laugh a lot. He didn't accept two sorts of jokes, dirty jokes and political jokes. They were banned. But all the other jokes he enjoyed terribly. I even remember that one day he stepped on a stool and imitated an uh, opera actress. And I thought, that's not true. And I thought, now a photo or a wire, uh, the, the, that would be a million dollars or something. Hitler had no close friends in whom to confide his innermost feelings. He could never admit human weakness to anyone. But the inner circle discovered one secret of his private life, which was unknown to ordinary Germans. When he, Hitler was talking with, um, with Ribbentrop for hours and I was standing near to the wall, waiting until they want some papers or something, and the curtain opened and a rather common face of Eva Braun appeared and said, Adolf, we must have luncheon now, please stop. No, and I thought such uh, interruption was awful now. Eva was a loyal, undemanding girl with a love of sport and fashion. She adored Hitler. She spent most of her time without him, pining for an attention which he rarely gave her. Nobody knew at that moment about the existence of her. And I think Hitler had her because she was simple and she didn't bother him with uh, political questions and he didn't want to give her influence and he, he didn't and he thought that as long as he is a bachelor he has the love from the german women because if he's married the impression is not the same on the other women and she gave him a little bit um, a home of a bourgeois 
quality with tea, with cake, and I think with sex, but no more. You think it was a sexual relationship? Certainly, certainly. A less respectful member of the inner circle took a rather idiosyncratic view of Hitler's sex life. He only loved his mother. She was the fountain of admiration, motherly admiration, you know. She, one mother can supplant a whole audience in Albert Hall. You must realize that. But he had her picture facing his bed. That was the rock of Gibraltar for him. Putzi Hamstengel was Hitler's foreign press officer. He had known him well since the early days of the Nazi party. He was, a, to my mind, uh, an important uh, admirer of the uh, super goddess of uh, Venus. Uh, he was a solo soloist. He was autochtone. He probably, well, uh, had the impression that he never had uh, really uh, been with a woman partner uh, in the last degree of uh, contact. Uh, it was all sort of a uh, plastic uh, thing for him, the sight of a woman's body, uh, that was enough for him. Since coming to power, Hitler had posed publicly as a man of peace. Privately, he told his generals to prepare for war. His aim was first to unite all the German-speaking peoples in a greater Germany, then to embark on a war of conquest in Eastern Europe. After five years in power, he began to shed the mantle of the peacemaker. I think that in some period around the end of 37-38, Hitler feels, well, this is fine, but I didn't come to power just to restore German self-confidence and so on, there's more. He changes gear, I think. And then he sweeps, you know, there is getting rid of a number of the old guard in the army and the foreign office and so on. And he becomes more aggressive, more provocative. Hitler's first step towards a greater Germany was union with Austria, the country of his birth. In March 1938, German troops crossed the Austrian border to be welcomed by ecstatic crowds. The other European powers did nothing. After Austria, Hitler's next target was Czechoslovakia. Reinhard Spitze, secretary of Ribbentrop, the German foreign minister, revisits the building where the Munich conference was held in September 1938. Hitler planned to invade Czechoslovakia, ostensibly to free the German minority there. The conference tried to find a peaceful solution. The delegates agreed in this room on a settlement which forced the Czechs to surrender the German-speaking area. Nowadays, Munich is remembered as a German victory and a humiliating act of appeasement by Britain and France. At the time, Hitler felt he had been deprived of a war of conquest. Uh, Hitler didn't like uh, this Munich conference because he had the feeling that he was um, cheated of his little war, smashing Czechoslovakia, and Hitler was very much annoyed by this sort of democratic conversation. The British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain flew home to a hero's welcome in London, waving a piece of paper signed by Hitler. It meant, he said, not only peace with honor, but peace for our time. Back in Munich, Reinhard Spitzi heard what Hitler thought of that piece of paper. When Hitler and Rimdrop stepped out from this building, I was following them, and I listened to their conversation. Rimdrop complained about the ridiculous piece of paper that Hitler had signed together with Chamberlain. 
Hitler said, don't bother. This piece of paper has no importance at all. And then I heard and I was convinced that Hitler did not intend to keep the Munich Agreement. Though Hitler disliked the Munich Agreement, it made him more popular than ever. A wave of relief and gratitude for the Führer swept Germany. His iron nerve, it was believed, had freed the Germans in Czechoslovakia and yet averted war. If Hitler had died in 1938, let's say, before the war started, before there was any genocide, I am sure he would have gone down in German history as one of the greatest, perhaps the greatest German statesman who ever lived, despite the obvious harassment of the Jews. November 1938, the Nazis organize a great anti-Jewish pogrom, the Night of the Broken Glass. All over Germany, synagogues are burnt, Jewish shop windows are broken. Thousands of Jews are arrested, thousands more emigrate. Bemused Germans see stormtroopers attack the houses of their Jewish neighbors. Well, when the stormtroopers came, they entered the house uh, screaming aloud, Judah, Verrecke, raus mit den Juden, and they entered the flat of the Goldbergs and threw their piano out of the window. They threw a typewriter out of the window and they smashed the furniture inside their flat. I um, didn't understand the world anymore. Uh, I asked my mother, why are these men doing such things? And she told me, don't worry, they are Jews anyway. And I said, well, are there other uh, kind of people? And she said, yes, they are like uh, vermin in the larder. Sie sind hinterlistig, feige und grausam und treten meist in großen Scharen auf. In this Nazi propaganda film, Jews are portrayed as plague-carrying rats. Though many Germans were prejudiced against the Jews, only a very small minority shared Hitler's homicidal anti-Semitism. But Hitler's control of the media and education gradually persuaded most Germans to ignore what was happening to the Jews. Uh, the teachers uh, told us, uh, don't worry about what you see, even if you see some nasty things which you may not understand. Always think Hitler wants to create a better Germany, a clean Germany, and uh, don't worry, everything will work out fine in the end. Many Germans up until the Kristallnacht believed Hitler was engaged not in genocide, certainly, it seemed to be a minor form of harassment of a disliked minority. But after the night of the broken glass or the Kristallnacht, no German could any longer be under any illusion. I believe it was the day that we lost our innocence. But it would be fair to point out that I, myself, never met even the most fanatic leader of the Hitler youth who advocated the extermination of the Jews. Certainly, we wanted the Jews out of Germany, but we did not want them to be killed. Even after the night of the broken glass, almost no one suspected that the terrible prophecy Hitler made early in 1939 might have to be taken literally. Ich will heute wieder ein Prophet sein. Wenn es dem internationalen Finanzjudentum in und außerhalb Europas gelingen sollte, Die Völker noch einmal in einen Weltkrieg zu stürzen, dann wird das Ergebnis nicht die Bolschewisierung der Erde und damit der Sieg des Judentums sein, sondern die Vernichtung der jüdischen Rasse in Europa. The destruction of the Jews was only part of Hitler's demonic vision of an empire dominated by the German master race. Early in 1939, he opens the new Reichschancellery, built to rule a German empire which he boasts will last a thousand years.
At the time, few Germans could imagine exactly where the Führer's megalomania would take them. His vision, as it unfolded, was to be breathtaking and awful in its audacity. And nothing was more staggering than Hitler's belief that he could turn his obsessions into reality by sheer willpower. The failed artist in a Viennese doss house now had the biggest study in the world.